All right. So this week's notes um, is all about pretty much the human body in space and um, how we have developed different tools so that humans can be in space a little bit long term. Um, we're going to get more into, well, no, we're kind of just going to talk about the human body in space and what tools have been developed so that we are able to be in space for extended periods of time. All right. Um, so we have stresses in space notes and staying alive. How do we stay alive? All right. So I'm going to kind of go through both of them. I'm going to go through both of them. Um, so stresses in space, just an overall summary. Um, Living in space does affect our the astronauts' bodies. Our bones weaken without gravity. Our muscles lose strength. Fluids shift in the body. Our brain health is affected by space environment. Radiation and space debris pose threats. Um, we have different weight-bearing activities, uh, like on the aircraft, whatever the spacecraft they're on, um, so that they can still build their keep their muscle tone and stay healthy before they come back down. And there's different space gym equipment and exercises. Um, and also space sickness can be overcome with different training. And then we're going to briefly talk about Dr. Patricia Cowling's works that helped uh, astronauts handle space sickness. So effects on the body. So bones lose 1% to 2% of their strength each month without gravity. Your spine also gets longer. Muscles themselves lose 5 to 6% of their strength each month without gravity. Um, after being in space, your aerobic capacity, so your walking, running, swimming, those types of things, your capacity, your ability to do that can drop by 25% after a month in space. Um, your fluids move from your lower body to your upper body, so we get puffy faces and little skinny legs. Um, your fluid shifts affect your vision, smell, and taste. So because this fluid has repositioned itself, um, our taste buds and things we're smelling, all of that up here can be a little, a little bit different because we're going to have more fluid up here. And our brain health is also affected by disrupted sleep cycles, um, construct, uh, confined spaces. So you're no longer able to be in your big king, queen, full-size bed. You're in like a little bunker. Um, and also the monotony of daily activities. So the repetition of what you're doing, you can't go just, you just feel like going down the street to go see your friends. You can't, you're in space and you know, the view outside is going to be the same as long as you're up there. The view inside is going to be the same as long as you're up there. So that repetitiveness does affect your brain health. And in some ways it could affect your mental health, just sitting in that confined space same people every day for a month, two months, three months on end. Um, other threats in space include uh, harmful radiation. So you're out there, you are, there is no um, atmosphere protecting you from the radiation out there. So that is a big risk. That is why we have the suits. That's why there's so much protection on the spacecraft themselves. Um, there's also the threat of debris and tiny asteroids damaging the ship, damaging your suit while you're out on a spacewalk. Um, just those little tiny things can come up. Um, I do, I think we're gonna play the gravity scene um, for what you'll, so I can kind of give you an example of what happens when all these little pieces of debris come and they're just small, but they can puncture all these um, big tools that we have made out in, on earth and sent up there. Um, so why do bones lose strength without gravity? Um, so there's no gravity there to pull and there's no kind of resistance. So that resistance is not there like it is here. So you have to um, somehow create that resistance to keep these bones, I mean, these muscles still kind of pushing and um, building that tension to keep the muscle tone up. All right. Um, Yeah, weight-bearing activities on earth cause positive stress on bones. So just things like walking, things like moving a chair, picking up things, that resistance is allowing your muscles to quote-unquote work. 
working out in a space gym. So space gym equipment needs to work muscles, keep bones strong and maintain aerobic capacity. So they don't have dumbbells and barbell weights. Um, they mainly have a lot of, well, what I've seen is uh, resistance bands because you're pulling it and the tension is created through the elasticity of the of the band. Whereas a dumbbell or barbell, it's reliant on weight. So when you, there's no weight as you lift that up, it's not going to cause, um, it's not going to give the impact that it would as on earth. All right. Um, and then lastly, space sickness. So space, space, sickness, uh, space sickness is similar to motion sickness. So symptoms range from mild nausea to severe discomfort and vomiting. 60 to 80% of people who travel to space have experienced space sickness. So we're going to talk a little bit about Patricia Cowings. And how does she do, what does she do to handle space sickness? So using st science to conquer space sickness. So this is Patricia Cowings. I hope I'm saying that correctly. So she was a research psychologist in the biomedical division of AMA's research center. Patricia Cowings investigated the psychos. Uh, physiological and biological problems experienced by astronauts in space in the early 1980s. Um, better known as space sickness, it is a real problem for astronauts. She induced sickness so she could learn how to combat the effects. Because astronaut tining, time, training time is precious, she had to come up with a program that would take astronauts lo no longer than six hours to control the sickness. So basically, she designed a program of 12 half hour sections combining training with biofeedback during the training she teaches a subject how to mentally invoke a sensation like relaxation of the muscles to bring about um, desired physiological changes such as increased skin temperature or relaxed muscles cowing's brand of biofeedback involves having to control as many as 26 physiological functions related to motion sickness these include things as heart rate, rate of respiration, and the flow of blood to the hands. So subjects, people that were being trained and astronauts had to learn to regulate these um, atomic functions by watching them as they are displayed on an oscilloscope. So basically, her training process um, prepares astronauts to mentally try to control things that are usually just um, automatic for us. So their heart rate, their, um, relaxation of the muscles. And it's, you're in a, some, you would say a high stress environment. So she had to train them how to mentally, um, calm down those, uh, those automatic responses to the high stress environment. All right. Now our staying alive section. So staying alive, how do we stay alive up there? So we've got um, trying to stay calm and restructure how our natural, our body's natural tendency to become sick up there. We have our resistance bands to keep our muscles in somewhat shape. Um, and we have the suits and the, uh, Autocraft to actually protect us from radiation. So what else do we need? So staying alive um, includes, you know, how are we getting our water and oxygen up there? All right. So we're going to talk about humans and their need for water, clean air, and a regulated environment. Oh. Excuse me. We're going to talk about the saboteur process and how that converts carbon dioxide and hydrogen into water and methane for the astronauts on the ship. Um, and we're gonna, the, and that's one of the special life support systems used on the ISS. So humans need um, basic food, clean water, clean air, regulated environment to survive. All right, so the spacecraft system needs to somehow recycle air and provide enough oxygen for the crew to breathe. So spacecrafts also use a system control um, to control humidity levels inside, sorry. Um, so why do we need these life support systems? So it's kind of common sense, but it's not, you know, we could go up there for um, a month. 
We need to somehow have the people alive up there. So mission to other planets can take months or years to complete. So we need to figure out how can we sustainably live in space to get to these different locations. Um, life support systems on the spacecraft allows for more crew members, longer stays in space, and reduce operating costs. Coming back and forward, back and forward, um, that causes more cost. But if you're able to just sustainably be up there and you're recycling air, water, things like that, um, you're reducing the cost it takes to send people up there. All right, so how are we doing this? How are we recycling our air, water, things like that? So it was developed by, um, I think, Patrick Sabatier. I'm probably, I don't want to say his name wrong. Um, ah, I liked. <laughs> Yeah, Paul Sabatier, Nobel winning, Prize winning French chemist who developed a process to produce water and methane from carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So the way it works, this is a simplified life support systems vision uh, video, I mean, picture developed by NASA. So we start off with urine, of course, where else will we get the water that we need to recycle? So urine, it goes through a urine processor and it goes through two different step, steps. It can go through the brine processor and go into water vapor to the cabin, or it will come down to the water processor. And here, humidity is going to um, get it to where it comes out um, and we're processing the water um, content inside of the urine. So we're recycling that water content and trying to basically filter out the waste portion. So we get the water processor um, and the water part comes out and it comes to the carbon dioxide reduction. So we take the carbon dioxide out of that water. All right, so the carbon solid is disposed or we get vented extylene um, or we leave the water processor and, or the urine leaves the water processor and it comes down to the oxygen generator. So when it comes to this step, oxygen comes out. And uh, as it comes through the water processor to the oxygen generator, we get potable water that they can actually use. So it's a quick step here for them to get water, water vapor, carbon dioxide. Now we can further take that hydrogen um, from the oxygen generator, we break it up and we get um, hydrogen to come out here, go to our carbon dioxide reduction, and um, it goes and it becomes a part of this carbon solid disposal. Um, when it comes to our air, so we have our cabin air that goes through trace contaminant control, and then it's filtered out into purified air. Purified air is then reused the unpurified air goes to carbon dioxide removal and it goes back here. So it's kind of like two systems in one. You're the astronauts um, waste, to both types of waste, liquid waste, gas waste, um, and they're being broken apart in different processes. All right. And then the last thing is water electrolysis. electrolysis. Um, electrolysis of water is important in spacecraft life support systems. Running electricity through water separates hydrogen and oxygen and releases them as gases. All right. So overall, um, this week's notes is about what is in space that can cause harm to us and what have we developed so that we can be out in space longer so we can continue to explore and continue to gain more information and bring that information back. Am I right? Um, that is it for these notes. Um, where's my thinking?